Okay, well, I don't know whether it's a Boker Tov, Sarayim Tov, or Erev Tov, but whatever mm-hmm. it is, whenever you're watching this, because uh, obviously this is between America and Israel, so I'm in the Boker Tov, you're in an Erev Tov, and our viewers are someplace all over the place. But welcome, everybody. We're going so to Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov, that's true also. Chodesh. And uh, right, we never know what's going to be when they watch it. Uh, so, uh, very excited about this. This is an opportunity to talk about uh, that amazing documentary, uh, which told us the life of the late, great uh, Prime Minister Yusuf, Yusuf Shamir, who uh, is somebody, I don't know if Americans know as much about him as they do others. Um, so I'm very glad that this was made. It was made beautifully. It was made intellectually. It was made with great, great skill. And it tells an astounding story. Uh, so from that point of view, I'm extremely happy because many Americans and I guess others will see it, um, that will learn more about this great hero of the establishment of the state of Israel and, uh, the, the growth of the state of Israel. So to introduce, um, that great man to more and more people is something that is wonderful. And I'm very pleased that you did it. And we're pleased to have, uh, with us, um, Yair, his son, uh, and we have others with us, as you can see. We have Erez, we have Gal, uh, and we have Noah, and all these people are involved in making this documentary happen. Um, we who are not in the world of creating movies or documentaries, we really don't know. Well, we watch something for one hour, and we don't, you know, we forget this is years of commitment of a thought process and a creation process. And over and over and over again and perfecting it. So it, it's a work of art and uh, we don't, you know, we will go to a museum, we see a work of art, we look at it for three minutes and a person put a great deal of their soul and their life into it. I know you put your soul and your life into it. So I'm gonna begin with some questions. Um, we're gonna start with somewhat of a lighthearted question and it's really almost like an American type of question. Um, Americans are used to leaders that have an extremely strong physical presence. Maybe other countries are too. I don't know enough about them. And I can tell you, Americans tend to gravitate towards that strong physical presence. George Washington, read everything about him. The big deal was he, he rode in on that white horse and everybody just looked up and said, oh my God, his physical presence is part of the reason he was successful. He even intimidated the British, British with his physical presence, this huge man on the white horse. Lincoln was a very large man. You look at Hollywood, they're either big and strong like John Wayne or they're extremely good looking, right? And then you had uh, presidents uh, who were, had such a presence, uh, Kennedy, uh, Johnson, Clinton, uh, the, the, the height of the first George Bush, uh, Ronald Reagan, the good looks, the, the speaking ability. Now we look at the powerhouse that, but he didn't have that physical presence. So what I want to ask you, and obviously the uh, ear can comment the most, but all of you, how did a person who didn't really command from our perspective, didn't command the room, didn't impress with this physical, powerful presence, yet he was an unbelievable powerhouse. How do you see that happening? That he was able to, this a little, this not very big man, create a presence and a power that was overwhelming. That people gravitated to him for the hard jobs and he commanded the room and he walked in. So maybe I'll start. By the way, the same question have been asked uh, by a student who make his PhD studies about how comes that the, that the person with such a low e- ego who never fight or never fought for any job get to the top of the pyramid of the political pyramid in Israel and he got a PhD for that. So, mm-hmm. but just into the go to the bottom line is that his ideologic way and his focus on it and he doesn't care about the way but to get to the target that was his power or powerhouse, as you said, and, peop- and people follow him and trust him. 
And his modesty and humble, humbleness and the fact that his ego was zero, and I can give a lot of examples about that, basically he became more and more trustful by the people. They believe what he said, because what he said, he meant it. So, wow. uh, and on top of that, he speak very few words, few sentences, but, make, but made a lot. Uh, if you look at his history, he was the, the head of the underground that kicked off the British out of him. He went for 10 years for the Mossad and was, people don't tell too much about this period of time, but from some of the hints that I'm getting, he was superstar at that as well. And, uh, and of course, in, in the, um, when he was the speaker of the Knesset, he changed the role of the speaker of the Knesset before his days or prior to his days, it was a very unadministrative job. Nobody really cared about him. Once he changed, he changed the, the position of it and so on and so forth. I don't want to go much further than that, but he was a unique person. Maybe mm -hmm. to, in these days, in, when he started all this, uh, going to the politics, the TV was not existing in Israel or even if it was, it was not really what it is today. But I still think that even today, there is a lot of articles in the newspapers that people are striving for personality like my father. They want somebody to trust it. They want somebody that show the way and they will not read the newspaper every day and change the, the avenue where it's going to. He has a way, you know what he's doing, and he never, never care about himself. You know, when he mm -hmm. lose the election, he said, gentlemen, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. went on. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You don't believe him. You, you, don't vo you didn't vote for me. Thank you very much. I've done my best. And he went on. So, Amazing. This is the I, I want, I want yes, to add uh, something about uh, uh, your uh, beautiful question. Uh, Itzhak Shamir was, uh, was honest. Itzhak uh, Shamir uh, uh, told the truth to his people. Uh, Itzhak Shamir was a brave man. Itzhak Shamir was a decision maker, a very brave decision maker. He, he dedicated his whole life to uh, the people of Israel uh, from childhood, uh, through the Mahtere, through the Mossad, through the Likud party, in the Knesset. Um, I think that Itzhak Shamir was uh, um, uh, a person to rely on. Uh, uh, Israel is a state, uh, you know, in uh, a lot of uh, uh, challenges. So we can't uh, have a prime minister that just looking nice or look, uh, look, uh, look, uh, uh, looking uh, uh, big or impressive, you know, we need someone to really lead us. Mm. And that's what is Hak Shamir. Uh, by the way, like Ben Gurion, he was a short too. That's true. And yeah. uh, like Eshkol, he was yeah. short too. And, and, uh, and, and Shamir, had better, Shamir had better hair than Ben Gurion. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes, he was. Uh, <laughs> no. no, no, no. Uh, ben Gurion was, I think, Ben Gurion was more than Shamir. I think Shamir was the third in uh, the, uh, you know, in uh, uh, his, uh, in, in the office. It's, it's mm -hmm. Shamir was uh, seven years. I think Ben Gurion was a, a little more. And, you know, be, be, be Netanyahu is uh, much more than the both of them. Right, right, right. So that, let, let me pick up on that because you said he was honest. He was clear. He was direct. Um, he was modest. Do you think he could get elected today? I mean, what we just described is no politician I know. Look, uh, if, if you follow, as, as I said before, if you follow interviews or you follow uh, articles in the, in the magazines and newspapers, people are trying to say, I'm like Shamir, I'm like this. Mm. And Shamir have done that. Is a kind of symbol, is a kind of uh, people want to imitate him or 
some of them took him as a role model. But uh, because today it's looked like it's, uh, it's, there is some kind of emptiness, a vacuum mm -hmm. among the leadership. And he was mm -hmm. a small guy, but, if we, but once you know him, you really, if he speak very, as I said before, very little. But once right. he spoke, everybody was quiet. It's interesting because there's a parallel here in America. There's a great deal of new interest in Harry Truman now. And Harry Truman, very much yeah. the way you just described, is Shamir, is Harry, Harry Truman didn't have a lot to say either. Yeah. He was a doer. And he certainly was not a physically impressive person yeah. whatsoever. And he was not a good speaker. He really was not a good speaker yeah. at all. Uh, so it's an interesting parallel. Maybe people want to get back to real people. So Noah, you're, you're kind of like marketing this film, right? You're involved. So do you see it? What's the challenge of marketing something really about a person who's not that well known outside of Israel? So for instance, when I, I had the privilege of introducing a um, documentary they did on uh, Rabin a few years ago, we packed the room. We didn't even have to advertise. You just say, yes, like Rabin, boom, Americans show up. Is that, or Golda, my goodness. You don't have to say Golda Meir, just say Golda, and they show up. Uh, and there was one on BB also, which actually was very well done and very fair. Very, it showed both sides. Uh, and they packed it, no problem. Yisla Shamir, what challenges do you see in selling it? I mean, he's still an icon. He's still prime minister or former prime minister. And, and as Erez mentioned, he was the third like prime minister in Israel in the, in the terms of how long he was in the office. Now, as far as I'm concerned, and I think that many viewers or audience will agree with me, is that he was a true icon, really, like people looked up to him. Nowadays, I mean, we have schools named after him, a hospital in Israel, he's, wide no he's well known, really well known. Regarding the American audience, I think that many of them do know Shamir, they do know his name. He, he does stand for, for integrity, for honesty, for all of the values which we have spoken about. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that people still know him. I mean, he's, he, he's made such a tremendous impact, by the way, not only in Israel, but also in the entire Middle East because of the Gulf War and the Madrid uh, Peace Conference. I mean, he, he was very much in the international stage. So I think that people, I mean, even the, the a bit more older people, the older generation, they know him for sure, mm -hmm. but they remember him from the news. But even my generation, even my generation, Israel knows him. And I think that also, I think that is, I think that also Americans in the States who, you know, who learned a bit about Israel, they also know about Shamir because he's really deeply integrated in the state of Israel. Frankly, I cannot, I cannot imagine Israel without Shamir. Mm -hmm. I mean, he brought so many immigrants. I'm sure Yair can also speak about that. He brought so many immigrants from Russia, from Ethiopia. I mean, he really made Israel what it is today. And I think that Americans, I mean, some of them know it, but I mean, the thing is that Shamir was also clandestine. He was secretive. You know, this is why the documentary is very important because it really shows you behind the scenes of, of the secrets that have never been revealed before. Right. So, so I think that the audience does know Shamir, but he will also be interested in knowing, you know, the, the behind the details, uh, behind the scenes. So, mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. No, I want to go to that point you meant about the fact that in his early years, he had to be very secretive. Which, by the way, I, I always wondered if his connection with uh, George Bush, obviously the first George Bush, Bush came out of um, CIA uh, and George Bush was a very, he kept it close, he played it close to the chest because that's the only thing you do if you came out of uh, underground or intelligence. I wonder if they had a, re a relationship because of that, a respect for each other's past. But there's something I mentioned, uh, you know, did I learn new things? Uh, and I learned new things and others are going to learn new things as well, no matter how much they think they know about it. And that has to do in the early years when he prevented a civil war in Israel. I read about this plan of uh, Eliyahu, who uh, was the other one in, in Lehi, uh, that Eliyahu, who seemed to be a little bit off the reservation, as we say in, in, in English, he seemed to have a plan 
actually to assassinate some of the Yishuv leaders that he thought was, was too soft, right? Just too soft. Uh, this is not a story that's well known. Um, and Shamir, he knew this could not happen. Civil war could not happen. So I want to hear more, a little bit of that story, because I think it's one of the most unknown stories and the difficulty of, of Yitzhak Shamir having to rein in, control, and basically eliminate uh, a colleague uh, in Lehi. Uh, that a very difficult thing to ask a person to do, but as dedicated as he was to Lehi, his dedication was to the Am Yisrael, Medinat Yisrael, that was his dedication. So if Lehi served the purpose, it served the purpose. But if somebody went wrong in Lehi, he had to serve Am Yisrael, and he knew what the future was. So I want to hear a little bit more about that particular story. I think it will interest our listeners. Um, if I may, um, in, the, in, in the year uh, 1941, Yair Stern, who was the creator of Lehi, was assass assassinated by the British police. And then uh, later on, my father took over. And it was on, it, when he was 27, 26 years old. And as I said before, he has one goal, to create and the an independent state of Israel for the Jewish people. And everything that didn't fit here, and Eliyahu Giladi didn't fit here. Yeah. And, the, the, uh, and Eliyahu Giladi was, was a threat to the un, uni, unified the, 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 the people in Israel. And he made something which very few people can do, especially in this kind of age, 27. And he made the decision and that basically save, save us a lot of troubles and on the way to become an independent state. But regarding the, the previous issue that you raise about American audience, I can tell you the one thing. With George Schultz, he has, I would say, more than friendly relationship. They were talking very frequent, very open, we trust each other. And uh, with Baker, James Baker, they have a lot of first discussions, but respect. And there's a lot of stories and uh, some of them appear in the books of uh, the autobiographic of James Baker about my father. Mm -hmm. uh, and, in, and after my father was not anymore in, in politics and was not public personalities anymore, every time James Baker came, came to visit Israel, he came to visit my father. Mm -hmm. And in uh, one of his visits, just on the way to my, my father's office, he got a note that her mother, his mother passed away. And his mother was 97, 94 years old, and she was a religious, a Christian religious. Mm -hmm. And he, he knocked on the door, my father's office, and said, I'm sorry, I just say hello. I just got a note that my mother, which I love a lot, passed away in the age of 94. And then he traveled to the airport and flew to the US. Couple of, a, a week later or two weeks later, he got a huge package to his office in Washington. And when he opened it, it was a big, um, I would say picture of uh, a stone in Jerusalem forest. And it's and stated that it's Chag Shamir planted 94 mm. in the mountain of nah. Jerusalem on behalf of his mother. He, he said by himself, tears coming up. And he mm -hmm. said, this is such a man. Right, right. So I wanted that story, the Baker story. Um, obviously, American Jews had very mixed feelings about James Baker. Okay, we can tell you yeah, that. I know. Uh, James Baker was a big guy. He was tall and we had mixed feelings about him. But th I, this, this story was something I learned new and that was, and it impressed me a great deal because I'm picturing Shamir and Baker, you know, and, and there's different sizes. When Baker got a little bit flustered and you tell the story about how, you know, they, they kind of became friendly in the end, but that story about when, when your dad says to him, do not raise your voice to me. I am the prime minister of Israel and I am the head of the Jewish people and Baker backed down. 
I thought that moment uh, was so defining of his confidence in who he was, but even more so, I want to focus on his statement and the leader of the Jewish people. What his obviously his whole goal was to, you know, Aliyah, he's very big on Aliyah, the, the Russian Aliyah, the youth. It was all consistent with, with his view from the very early years uh, of his life. So it's not surprising they supported Ethiopian and Russian Jewry Aliyah. But his sense of being the leader, not just of the state of Israel, but of the Jewish people. I don't know if the prime minister of Ireland sees himself as the leader of the Irish community in America. I kind of doubt that, right? Certainly doesn't yeah. talk about it, right? Uh, so I was curious about that, his sense of his place, not only his place, the place of Israel in terms of world Jewry. So anyone to comment I, on that? I would tell please. you, it's, 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 you say leader, that's true, but it's, it, from his point of view, it's the responsibility for every Jew ground. Mm -hmm. It's it doesn't care if the, if the Jews will vote for him or will love him or not. His responsibility that he took on himself is for every single Jew. And I give you an example. One of the conditions for the Madrid conference was that Americans would put pressure on the Syria to release all the Jews in, in Syria. They mm -hmm. were locked down. And guess what? Those Jews are in Israel. That's right. So absolutely. Even in those moments that he was struggling with uh, George Bush and uh, the father and uh, Baker and so on, what he was concerned, uh, and there was not a huge number, it was a couple of hundreds. That's the it. rest have fled uh, prior to that. He insists that this will be precondition for the conference. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That's so, that's what, and you know, by the way, if you go to the history, Yudah Maccabee mm -hmm. and his brothers, the Hashmonaim, they used to rescue Jews from Jordan, from Syria, from Lebanon. If you go to mm -hmm. the history, right? They have absolutely. It reminds me also when he said. Uh, I think it was the baker who said it, uh, when there was an argument about where Russian Jews would go that when they started to empty out of uh, the Soviet Union. And we know, of course, in America, that the, the greatest hero in behalf of uh, political hero on behalf of Soviet Jewry was Henry Scoop Jackson of Washington State. So we know he didn't do it to get the four Jewish votes in Washington State in those days. Yeah. You know, he didn't do it for Jewish votes. He did it for many reasons that had to do with his, father, yeah. his uh, being in the army uh, during World War II and seeing the camps. Uh, but but there was understanding that the United States stood with Israel in terms of trying to help Jews as some type of moral responsibility. Uh, but when he fought to bring them to Israel, and uh, I think it may have been Baker, somebody said, well, they have a right to choose where they want to go because they are stateless. And his answer, there are no Jews after the state of Israel was created who are stateless doesn't exist. And there was, no, it was, as you know, and I think close to 90% of Russian Jewry who exited uh, the former Soviet ended up in Israel. And as we like to say in Miami, the other 10% ended up in Sunny Isles, Florida. So uh, you know, <laughs> must have been a deal we had. And Brighton Beach, right? So I wanted to ask Iggy a question. Iggy's a little, Iggy and Noah are like, you know, a little bit younger than the rest of us up here. Um, so they couldn't have grown up with, you know, w watching the news while Shamir was active. So I'm Iggy, when, as you were involved in this, were you learning new things about Shamir or was Shamir covered pretty well in your uh, education? Because you didn't experience him directly, or at least you don't have too much of a memory of that. So uh, it, uh, it was fascinating uh, to, to understand and uh, to reveal uh, is the main station, as uh, we spoke uh, before about in the Mossad, uh, the Secret Service and the, and the Lehi Party, and uh, trying to understand. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I will use uh, something that Yair uh, told once. Uh, Shamir was like a lighthouse uh, in, in, the, in the port. Maybe it's mm -hmm. not the, the prettiest uh, uh, building uh, at the port, but it's very solid, it's very clear. And you can see and define him uh, from very far away. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was as a solid rock. We spoke about Ben Gurion. 
So even, I think, even Ben Gurion, uh, you know, appealed today, no way uh, that he passed uh, through all the, 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 the news and, uh, you know, and the, the fake news uh, that we uh, hear a lot today. But uh, yeah. I think he, he was very focused and he, uh, he knew what he want and what is the best thing for his country. And this is the most uh, mm -hmm. uh, important thing that we, you know, uh, so looking for today, you know, there is a, a big e leadership issues, not only in Israel, you know, I think also in US, the, uh, a great example, the, the, the last, ele uh, the last uh, election. And right. these uh, right. were uh, other days, you know, uh, and um, kind of nostalgic uh, uh, for uh, that, uh, that period uh, of time. I want to say that Yitzhak Shamir is a symbol of leadership of the young people today. Uh, Yitzhak Shamir is not just a piece of history, important uh, uh, a piece of history, uh, is a symbol for a leadership today. Uh, you know, uh, VS, uh, uh, who is uh, now, uh, 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 not just in Israel, you know, there is a crisis of leadership. Uh, Everywhere, the whole Western world. world. Yes. Absolutely, yes. very true. Uh, Yair, you had something you were going to add yeah. there. Um, no, I just want to, uh, to maybe uh, it's, not, and it's not mentioned in the movie, but uh, it, he wrote one book. Uh, it was about his... Uh, autobiographic, mm -hmm. summing up. And in one of the, I think in the last chapter of the book, and it's very, you know, it's, it, does, it doesn't go into much, too much details. It's looked like that somebody forced him to write it. Because, uh, so he wrote as follow, and I will translate it into English. As for myself, I hope to be remembered as a man who loved the people of Israel and the land of Israel and stood by them all his life and in every way he had in his possession. Mm -hmm. And basically Absolutely. On, his, on his gravestone, I just quoted. So the only thing you want to do, oh, that's just perfect. remember me that I fought for this place and I fought for this people. Right. Now, uh, Iggy, you brought, up the light, you brought up the lighthouse thing. Now, I don't yeah. know if you know, but uh, I've, I've, I've spent most of my life as a pulpit rabbi. Uh, I'm now a rabbi emeritus. I do more teaching than I do pulpit. And actually, I sit in front of screens like we all do when I teach Zoom. Yeah. Um, so I'm in a, I'm in Miami, by the way. I don't know if that was everybody understood that, but that's what it's Miami Jewish Film Festival. So I'm in shorts and, and a shirt because it's 75 degrees here. The rest of the country is freezing. I don't know what it is in Israel these days. Uh, but as a pulpit rabbi, I actually use that lighthouse concept. And it, it was based upon a, 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 short, a short little um, metaphor in which a battleship is approaching and it sees a light and it tells the light it needs to move. It thinks it's a ship. Uh, and the message is back, no, you need to change course. It says, you don't understand, we're the battleship. I think you better change course. It says, no, I suggest you change course. It says, you know, we have the power to blow you out of the water. We're a battleship. And the message goes back, well, we're the lighthouse and we think you better change course. Okay, so that that was like him, right? The lighthouse, and you know, I'm here. Everybody else better understand what we're doing here in Israel, right? And everybody else is going to have to change course a little bit because we're here and we're not leaving. We're not moving. That's not for dis discussion. And I felt he was like the lighthouse, just standing there firmly. Yet, and let's go to the 19. Uh, let's go to the the Scud issue. And I remember speaking about it from the pulpit. What's that? Great minds think alike about uh, the light. Right, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you reminded me of it. And I, it, when the Scud issue occurred, we in America were stunned that Israel didn't respond. I mean, I say stunned doesn't mean that we didn't agree. Don't, don't confuse that. Um, stunned means is that this was not the Yitzhak Shamir that we knew. This was not the Israel we knew. Uh, we, we got missiles falling on Israel and they're not responding. Uh, now, most thought, most American Jews thought that was a good idea. It was the right thing to do because the alliance with America was more important. 
And the goal was the same. We got to get control of Saddam and send a very clear message because it, 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 you know, if it isn't Kuwait, it can be Israel. Who knows who it can be? So we agreed, but we were surprised. So what is it that we didn't understand about Prime Minister Yusuf Shamir that we couldn't have anticipated that he would work with Bush and that he would tell Israel the hardest thing Lockdown was the type of lockdown. Put the mask on and we are not going to respond. And then the follow up is, is there anything that would have caused him to respond that he would have had to say to Bush, you know, odd con, right? Uh, odd con. I, I can't hold it anymore. So anyone who wants to comment on that. Can you imagine, can you imagine an option that U.S. will be attacked by missiles and Want uh, uh, and want to take it nope. back? Can't imagine it. Can't imagine. In fact, I'll tell you the story that we told. They once they once said uh, when Israel was taking uh, missile attacks and people were objecting to them responding to Gaza, and uh, it was said, you know, if America was attacked, uh, George Bush would respond uh, within thirty minutes. And they asked Bush that. Bush said, "Absolutely not. I'd respond within five minutes." Okay, yeah, so no. yes. Yeah, but we couldn't have imagined it. We were shocked. We were shocked that Shamir did not respond. Oh, the there's, first a, time. there's a big, there's yeah. a big difference between uh, there's a huge difference between the state of Israel and the U.S. Uh, yes. But I would say, but I would say, my father, as it as it was not a real politics who always collect like from the audience or from everybody, uh, and he have done what he thought what he thought that this is the right decision for the state of Israel and the people of Israel. And though he, he knew that it's unpopular, it uh, it's will damage his, uh, his uh, reputation, he doesn't, he didn't care about it. He said, mm -hmm. this is, and the, and the reason is simple. It says, this is not our war. This is the war of America and the coalition against Saddam Hussein. We are not going to intervene it's not our war. Let them do the job. Mm -hmm. By the way, in other uh, circumstances, when the war didn't do anything, like destroying the nuclear facility in Iraq in '81, mm -hmm. there was a big debate in the. It's not mentioned in the in the in the movie, and there was a big debate. The Begin was the prime minister. My father was the foreign minister. And there was a big debate uh, among the ministers. Should we, um, I would say, stop the activities in this um, French-built uh, nuclear facility? Because it's, it was just a few weeks or a few days, I don't know exactly, before becoming hot nuclear uh, spot. So, so uh, the... Ian Begin persuade the other and press on the other, and on one vote, the decision was go. Not America, not this, not that, no one else. So, if in any case, if we have been if attacked out of the blue from Saddam Hussein, not related to the Desert Storm, I'm sure that Israel would be re reacted. So we have. Mm -hmm. I would say cool thinking and uh, very good nerves or strong nerves to stand under the pressure that he was by the army, by mm -hmm. the politician, by the people, whoever. And he said, no, period. Yeah. Sometimes okay. not doing anything or not responding is actually the strongest. Much more response. effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, that was, but it seemed inconsistent if you look at the life he led, which was a very, uh, strong right wing, clearly a right wing orientation. Uh, yet he understood, he, he really rose to the occasion and understood the world picture and his natural tendency to respond, he was able to gain control of. You know, um, who, who is strong? One who can control his passions, right? And that, right. that was his enormous, enormous strength. You know, I wanted to ask something uh, to get to the family because. We learned a little bit about the family uh, in, in the uh, documentary. And first of all, is the impact that his father had upon him. I don't know if the story is apocryphal, 
but it is included, and it's included in Wikipedia, by the way, um, where they asked his dad, uh, obviously, who was back in Europe, uh, if he was afraid. And he says, I'm not afraid because my son is in Israel. Um, and it was a similar story about the, the Turkish when there was a uh, anti-Semitic attack in, in Istanbul, I think it was, in Turkey. Yeah. And they asked somebody, uh, are you afraid? And he says, I'm not afraid there is an Israel. Uh, so even, I don't know how, if the story was true or not true, but whatever it is, it, his father's impact upon him was profound. So I was wondering, you growing up and obviously only hearing stories about uh, Zaidi, Saba, Grandpa, uh, did you have this sense of this enormous presence in his life? Yeah. So, so um, I would say the following. Big portion of my youth, he was not with us. He, either he was an exile in uh, Ethiopia when the British called him and sent him to mm -hmm. Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And I saw him first time, I think, uh, when I was three years old. And afterwards, when he worked with the Mossad, I was in Israel and he was abroad. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, but uh, uh, maybe uh, as it's mentioned in the, in the movie, that maybe in Damascus, maybe in Cairo, maybe elsewhere, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but his influence on us and on me and my uh, sister is huge. Huge, and it's it's. Uh, I would say that if I have advantage in life, it is that he was my father. Mm -hmm. That's if I have uh, uh, if I have to look backwards on my way, or I have to look out where I started and where I am, or if I look on my kids, where they started, where they are, it's reflection of my father. So I wanted to also talk about mom, uh, who obviously was very yeah. present in your life. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I want we only have one lady here. So we, we, I want to turn. No, imagine I, I want to get your feel about the role that she played, because yeah. I'm looking at this woman who not only the fear of losing her husband, but at one point it seemed to me the story suggested she became persona non grata. People didn't want to help her, didn't want to be associated with, 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 when he was gone he was away and i remember one point where there were you and um there were two of you two siblings uh very very young and she could hardly even find a place to stay because not because the, the because they were stopping her you know the british but because her her fellow jews seemed afraid to help her so so what was that your impression no when you were looking at the story um about this young wife with two children and a husband who was, you know, putting his life at risk and quite frankly, making your life pretty miserable. So uh, how did you react to that part of the story about Shulamit? Uh, it's a, uh, first of all, a few words about my mother. She was a unique mm -hmm. personality. And at the age of 18, she ran away from a very well wealthy house uh, in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, and she got, she was a, a uh, illegal uh, immigrants to the state of Israel. She was caught by the <laughs> British, go to the prison. And in prison, she get friends with Lehi girls. And when she came out, she become very active in Lehi and all the rest. And there she met my father and uh, she got married and so on. Okay. But later on, all the time, she was always with him. But it was just, it was not just, uh, I would say, uh, the analytical world that they both think from the same goal from the, the same Zionist and Judaism and so on, but also great love. It's uh, unique, I can tell you. The love between those two people, it's unique. And many people told me that, not just myself. Mm -hmm. And she was very lonely. On the other end, what you just mentioned, when he was away, and it was only me, and my, I was one year, two years uh, year old, and she looked for, uh, for an apartment in Tel Aviv. She couldn't get one. And, she, and we used to live on the roofs of Tel Aviv houses. Fortunately enough, it's too cold here, and she managed somehow. But always, we were teach, me and my uh, sister, never, never civil war between, never war between brothers. 
Mm -hmm. Forget about what they have done to us. Never. It was never mentioned. Though it was difficult, he couldn't get a job. He couldn't a mm -hmm. uh, decent job. He couldn't. And it's not just him. It's also the Lechi. The Lechi people, more of them, later on, it's work for them. Because it's because they make uh, they open their own businesses and they become wealthy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they didn't become a clerk in the administration or so on. Uh, um, but he he went to Mossad, of course, uh, you know, and uh, because just to do money, it's money was not an issue in our table uh, mm -hmm. and, and in their family. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> money. It's. Uh, that nobody you need it but you know it's not important so really no and so no what would you do with shulamit uh presenting her because i thought she was an she didn't get a lot of play in the movie, but uh from yeah, noah's we, perspective as a woman how would she sell the the, the aspect of shulamit to the audience the to, to the females well, Look, what we have what we have done uh, uh, yeah noah's going to speak now yeah go ahead yeah, no. I, okay. For me, she's a true example of an Eshet Chai. Truly, I mean, she dedicated herself to the cause. She sacrificed herself for her children and, and for her country. And, you know, there is a saying that behind every successful man, there is, success, uh, there is a strong woman. And mm -hmm. I think that in this case, it's true. I mean, I think that uh, it tracks owes her a lot, and because of that, also the state of Israel owes her a lot. I mean, basically, as I said, she's an Ashen I mean, I was completely inspired by her, you know, to put her. Yair mentioned that uh, Yitzhak didn't have an ego. I think that she was egoless as well. This is why, you know, they share the same vision. You know, she, she cared about the children. She put everyone else first instead of her. And I regrettably didn't have a chance to meet her in person, but just what I've, I've seen about her, I've seen about her from the movie, I mean, I was astounded. Yeah, she was truly an exceptional lady. Anyway, I think of her so much because in, in recent times, uh, worldwide, I'm not picking a country, but we found that our leaders uh, very often in their families feel so entitled so incredibly entitled. It's, really, it's, it's like infuriating. Uh, the entire, and yet the Shamir family obviously never played on the name. Uh, and even while they were uh, in a position of, of, of great authority and recognition, they seem to just shy away from any type of entitlement, almost embarrassed, like uh, almost like they wish they could have lived their lives privately but destiny was that we needed. What, you, what was your impression that you know, you're growing up? Look, uh, I like it. And basically my father never brought politics into the house and uh, never, we never discuss politics, small politics. We really discuss what's Jewish all about, what Judaism all about, what is Zionism, what is Jerusalem for the, 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 the people of, uh, of Israel? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is our uh, identity? What is the full picture of us? Where we are on the world? This was, this was very inspiring discussions. And my mother was very active on that. She was very active. On the other mm -hmm. end, when, uh, my, when my father used to go uh, every day on the uh, on the beach in Tel Aviv and afterwards in the park of Tel Aviv and people used to stop him on the way. He always, he doesn't care who's, he stop, he discuss with them and continue. Mm. And uh, it was so people jump on him and he, he, uh, he uh, really send them love back. And another issue that I want to mention is that we published when he was alive and uh, 22 letters, love letters that he wrote to her when he was, oh. uh, yeah, it was a letter to Shulamit. It, uh, it, 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 we printed in 3,000 copies, it disappeared in no It's amazing. I didn't and take him for, I did not take him for a love letter writer. Well. No, and, I didn't, uh, I, you know, I, I, before I do weddings, I've done hundreds of weddings, I asked the 
bride and groom to write me something about why they've decided to marry this person. And generally the woman writes me three pages and the man writes me a half a paragraph, right? Uh, so I didn't take that for being a love letter writer, but it's, it's nice to hear that. It's like, yeah, oh, not, too, it's yeah. not too late, it's not too late. It's like, it's like a Jacob and Rachel story. This is a, a, a deep love story, which they yeah. totally share the destiny. Let me, before we finish, I wanna to return to the Russian Jewry and the Ethiopian Jewry. Everyone understood why Israel would wanna bring as many Russian Jews to Israel, because you were talking about a highly educated, uh, motivated, talented uh, people in, in every aspect of life. Everyone knew that after the first difficult period of time that you have to you know, adjust an economy to a huge number of people, that this would alter Israeli society for the better. It would, it, the, 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 uh, they all came over with a piano on their back, right? Every, everyone knows music, everybody write, writes poetry, uh, they're active politically, uh, they're highly educated scientists. It was going to be good. Uh, Ethiopian jury was a different question. And we know in the beginning, particularly, there were some issues with the rabbinate that was very resistant to acknowledging them as Jews, which, of course, would block their coming. And I'm sure there were people who were motivated by this is going to be a huge burden. What are we doing? Uh, because it was going to take at least a generation for them to integrate and adjust. And they've proven themselves, uh, of course, extremely worthy of, of that. And even if they weren't, they're still Jews. So I'm wondering, how did dad feel about any resistance to the Aliyah of Ethiopian Jewry? And what was his relationship to a rabbinate? Uh, which I don't know if the impact upon, of the rabbinate upon Israel society was as strong then as, as it is now and how resentful the Israeli community is of the, of the rabbinate now, uh, and particularly the ultra-Orthodox community during this past year of COVID. There's a lot of tension there. What was his relationship, or it wasn't a big deal at that period of time to deal with the rabbinate and Ethiopian Jewry and the resistance to bringing Ethiopian Jewry, which he fought. He fought that resistance, and he won yeah. Look, for, for my father, he saw as part of his only job, only mission is to bring the Jews to the, the only place which is good for the Jews and safe for the Jews is the state of Israel. When he, he started, when he left the Mossad in 65, uh, he was not yet in the politics. He was very involved in, uh, in the movement, let my people go. Mm -hmm. and, he, he have a, lit, a lot of connection. I learned it later on with Chabad and many others organization, you know, there to send books and, uh, and, and uh, studies and uh, whatever to the, to the Jews in the Russia. And, and, the same, and when, he, when he brought them to Israel, it didn't make calculation they're educated or not educated. It didn't care. It, the only thing is care. Jews has to come back to their homeland, which is the, the, the land of Israel. And the same goes for the Ethiopians. And now I'll tell you a story about the Ethiopians. When uh, my, pa my father passed away, there was a, uh, I would say, um, national funeral and so on. It was full of Ethiopians. They rabbis, mm. they whatever you, it was there are, it all over the place. When we, we were sitting sh uh, Shiva, in my house, nobody came from, from this community. I, I got nuts, how comes? So, so, I don't know, maybe we insulted them there, maybe there was something wrong in the funeral, I didn't know. Years go by, then I met uh, one of the rabbi and I said, I saw you in the funeral of my father and you didn't come to the Shiva, what happened? He said, what does it mean? We were sitting Shiva in our home because he is my father. He's our father. <laughs> wow. He was sitting in our home. What, do you what think? a powerful he was, story. He was angry. He was furious that I raised him the issue. Wow, so, wow. I'm so there, glad that go, was clarified. If you go today to an apartment and the houses of uh, Ethiopian Jews, you will see the picture of my father. Wow. Now, contrast that with, if, if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory of Israeli politics is that when dad lost the election, uh, a lot of it had to do with the Russian Jews. I think they turned on them, right? Yeah. Uh, Ethiopian Jewry continue, continued to appreciate that. I don't, did the Russian Jews not understand what he had done to get them to Israel? And how did he feel uh, in his kishkas, you know, uh, 
in his heart. Terrible. How did he feel about the fact that, in many ways, Russian Jewry was the ones who pushed him out of office? He didn't care about it. He never <laughs> yeah. fought for a job. And he said, if, if the people vote against me, that's fine. I've done my job. I'm satisfied with what I've done. Thank you very much. I'm leaving. And uh, he was not looking to satisfy everybody. It was not like the people today is that everything, that everybody, they want to satisfy everybody. It doesn't matter if they're conflicting, uh, just to be nice looking and uh, promise things that you will never fulfill. Right. If you promise something, you fulfill it, even if it was unpopular uh, stuff. So you know, the point of view, the fact that he brought to Israel 1.2 million Jews mm -hmm. was the mission of his life. Now right. we wanted to bring 10 million. And uh, and about the and and by the way, when all the when all the operation to bring the the Ethiopians from um, from Ethiopia or from Sudan, basically, yeah, they were the airplanes were landed in an isolated uh, airfield. It was not in Ben Gurion, right? So my father, at, it was in the middle of the night. He went there. They didn't mm -hmm. recognize him. They, they, they didn't know who is he. He was yeah. standing there. Tears going down on his cheeks just to see that they are coming. Wow. It's yeah. Geula of this land. It's, uh, that's, that's, you know, it. that's my father. It's, he, it's exemplified, he exemplified for me two very that important Jewish not, teachings. Yeah. He exemplified for me two very important Jewish teachings. The first is Harodef Achreya Kavod, he who seeks honor, honor will elude him. He never sought it. It came to him. It chased after him in many cases, right? Particularly right. With, with Lehi. Uh, and then when for prime ministership, they went after him to bring him in. And the other is that the greatest leader in Jewish history was somebody who didn't want the job, and that was Moshe, right? So the whole chapter in the Torah about, I, you got the wrong guy, not me. I don't do this job, right? Uh, so Judaism acknowledges, and I think we should all understand, that the best leaders are almost always the ones who don't want the job because the ones who want the job will sell their souls to keep the job <laughs> or get the job. Uh, and we're, so we're watching that. We're watching that across the board. I don't have to, you know, it may sound like I'm picking on a certain leader. Unfortunately, it's so common now that you can't even guess what I'm talking about. It's just right across the board that people want the job too much and what they'll do to get it is too much, it's too much compromise, too much sacrifice, too many IOUs. And what they'll do to hold on to it is downright scary, downright scary. And that's in Western civilization. So I hope I would force every leader in the Western world. I say the rest of the world, too, but they don't really pay attention. But maybe wouldn't hurt. Right. Every leader in the Western world should have to watch the story of your social media. That's what a leader is. That's the kind of leader you need, particularly in a crisis. And that's the kind of leader who, when it's done, knows how to walk away with dignity and realize that history moves on. I played my role in history and not to take it personally. That's an amazing, amazing aspect of his persona, um, which is so admirable. So I'm so grateful to those of you who decided to make this documentary. I think it's going to be a huge hit in America. Uh, most people will probably end up watching it on Zoom. I don't think we'll be in the movie theaters watching it, but we're used to that these days. And ironically, I'll tell you the truth. Um, when we do our services now on Zoom, we have twice to three times as many people participating in when we do it live. I'm a much bigger success on Zoom than I am live in person, right? <laughs> so hopefully that's the same thing with this movie. The fact that people can access it so easy, they don't have to get into a car and drive to some theater in Yenensveld and be crowded and you know pay four bucks for lousy popcorn. They can sit home in their shorts and even pause it if they need to get something to eat or go to the bathroom. I think more people are gonna watch it. I am certainly going to send out you know, to my list and tell them how important it is to see this story of one of the great, great founders and role models for the future. And I'm so glad to hear that uh, the younger ones here know so much about him, that he's becoming a, a role model, uh, not only for what he did, but for who he was and the way he did it. It's just an amazing, 
example of what leadership should be like. And we need that in our world today because we have crises as serious as the one that he faced in 91 with the Scuds. And I don't know if our leaders today are as prepared as he was uh, to be a leader. I mean, he had the background. He didn't come into it out of nowhere. He was ready and prepared. But quite frankly, my impression was he was drafted, right? He was drafted. And uh, in my opinion, as we say in America, he was a number one draft choice. And he was the franchise player of that period of time. And hopefully people will hear his story. So I want to thank you on behalf of Miami Jewish Film Festival and all those is going to spread throughout the world for preserving his legacy, making it more available to the English speaking public and to tell stories that will make people so, so proud uh, of how Israel came into being and the great leadership uh, that your dad uh, provided to that country and the role model he was to, to the world as what a leader should be. So I wish you all a Yom Tov um, or an Erev Tov or a Boker Tov. And uh, <laughs> I was very, it was my privilege to be able to first of all see the movie before anybody else did in Miami. So that was great. Um, and I'm going to share it. I have four, I have 11 grandchildren in Israel, but we have four right here. In fact, they're downstairs waiting for me to finish so they can make noise. Um, <laughs> and three of them are definitely of age to watch this. I'm going to watch it with them um, so that they can really learn the story because a lot of kids today, they don't have very good role models as leaders. They really don't. I mean, very often we say the name and then we have to, we're embarrassed, embarrassed by the behavior. What a great thing. The greatest gift I'd say that uh, your dad gave to your, uh, to your family is that anytime you hear, anybody hears the name, it's uh, Shamir, and they look at you and say, that was your dad? Because, you know, you don't have the eyebrows. So you, you, we can't identify you as, as son <laughs> necessarily, right? So they get, they're going to say to you, he was a great man. I admired him so, so much. And what greater gift could a father leave to a son? And that gift has been gift wrapped for us in the movie, the documentary we're going to see. So to all of you, to the Rabbah, and uh, hopefully you'll continue and the movie makers and tell us some more stories about the incredible founders of Israel. Uh, we don't know enough about it. And after the prime minister book, people are even more interested in it because that was a pretty big success, certainly in the American Jewish community. So once again, thank you. And call thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.